Executive Suites with WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. The Link. That's the name the I-195 Redevelopment Commission has given to the parcels of Prime Providence property freed up by the Iway Project. The Link is our effort to reconnect. Hopes are riding high that the 19 acres of land made available for development can help jumpstart Rhode Island's economy and lay the groundwork for future growth. Last month, the commission signed off on a toolkit that offers developers a speedy process to get the permits necessary to build. And a national brokerage firm is now marketing the parcels coast to coast. But will anyone bite? This week on Executive Suite, the executive director of the I-195 Commission, Jan Brody, and 195 Commission Chairman, Colin Kane. Welcome to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and I'm glad to have back uh, Jan Brody and Colin Kane. You both were here, I think, a bit, uh, almost a year and a half ago now, maybe. It's been a while, or maybe a year. So a year. Uh, year. glad to have you here. I can't, it all runs together to me. So we have so much to talk about, so I want to keep things moving on this show. But let's start with a map. And I think we have it set up there to show viewers exactly how this 195 land has been divided up and uh, what you're trying to do with it. There we see it right there. So Jan, just give people the most basic reminder of what your job is here with this land. What you're looking at is about 19 acres of developable land. What you see in green are eight acres of parks and the pedestrian bridge that links um, the east to the west sides. Of that 19 acres, there are 17 developable parcels of which 14 are immediately available and are ready to be developed. Uh, the ones that are, the remaining three are either too small or encumbered by title. Um, and if you did a full build out, you could build at least three million, if not more, square feet of space. And what we're promoting is mixed use, whether that be residential or commercial or recreational. But basically stitching the city back together again, um, comprised of what the city currently is, which is a mixture of residential, commercial, and, and re retail. All right, and uh, that's that's a great summary. You've, maybe you've given that before once, <laughs> once or twice. Once or twice. <laughs> uh, and it's a linear mile. I mean, just to put it in perspective, Ted, it's a, it's 19 acres, and people they drive by it and they see a very they drive by it very quickly, and it looks like their backyard. Right. Uh, but the truth is, uh, 19 acres in an urban setting is an extraordinarily large amount of property, and it is a linear mile that runs from 95 all the way to the bottom of Wickenden. Uh, so I encourage uh, uh, members of the community, people, go take a walk, uh, and see very how very vast this is. Uh, and to put it in, in scale, three million square feet of new building fabric would be like building another third of downtown Providence. Wow. Uh, so it's a substantial amount of building fabric that we hope will be invested there. And just so people understand, you're not looking, uh, it's not likely we're going to have one massive plan come in and say, I'm turning this into the X. You're, you're expecting to have lots of different things come into these different pieces, right? It, it's not a campus. Um, it is not a master plan project. And we are putting all parcels out at the same time. The likelihood is that there will be some interest in one or two of the parcels initially, maybe in another six months or whoever knows how long, a couple more. We're not sure which ones will go first. Um, but it will happen over time. It will definitely happen over time. The, the interest and the market can only absorb so much at any given point in time. Especially with the economy, you're uh, the backdrop of the economy in Rhode Island right now. Well, I just thought just the economy of Rhode Island. Um, we look at the economy nationally when it comes to real estate. Uh, when the recession hit, uh, most equity capital, most investors fled to the core markets, Boston, Manhattan, San Francisco, Washington, D.C. Uh, and, and with the, the be beginning of an emerging economy, Ted, uh, we're just beginning to see those investors, uh, those people, uh, speculative investors, looking outside those core markets toward our secondary and tertiary cities, Providence being one of them. Uh, but other secondary and tertiary cities uh, are similar in Providence to the extent that they've seen a a lag uh, in vertical development over the last uh, you know, five to eight years. And you have out now this developer's toolkit. Maybe Jenny can hold it up I right in front can. of you there and people can <laughs> see this is how, uh, this is, it's a long document. How many pages all together? It's about 140 pages, <laughs> and but of that about 30 to 40 pages are the nuts and bolts of how a developer can submit a project, get it approved, and what the role of the commission, what the role of the developer is, what the fees are, what the zoning is. It puts it all in one place. What we tried to do was make it very business and user friendly. So that basically with this tool, with our RFI, it says to developers and investors, you can get it done here. 
You can did it, get it done quickly. It, it maps out the entire timeline. And Colin, you're a developer in your day job. How, why is it important in terms of actually, people want to see cranes at some point, as you say. Why is that such an important step? Well, both Jan and I come from a develop, the development community. Uh, and you know, when you look at developing in urban settings uh, like this, uh, there are very complicated issues. Uh, environmental uh, stormwater management, uh, tidal issues, as Jan described, where the sewer and the water is. Uh, so the, what the commission worked very hard over the last uh, two years uh, was to understand all of those component pieces, uh, put them in a package, uh, so that when uh, Channel 12 wants to build its corporate headquarters in downtown, uh, we've managed all of those variables well ahead of time to provide a very predictable underwriting process. Uh, so we've looked at it from a developer, an investor, and a lender's perspective, and we've managed all of those variables ahead of time. And w what it's doing is it's uh, making very quick the pre-development period for a developer. And that's usually the most at-risk time. They don't know whether they've got the ability to actually get their project approved. Um, this puts it in a very consistent and predictable. It needs to be predictable so that a developer who starts a project, starts to invest their money, know that they can get to the end closing and begin. Not 24 months to permit through DEM or Coastal Resources, but in our case, 45 days. Uh, we worked uh, with our partners at Coastal Resources, DEM, the City of Providence, and uh, Nar Narragansett Bay Commission. Uh, we, have, we have the first general permit on all 19 acres ever issued by those agencies. Now, we had a front page story in the Providence Journal this week after you did an open house, and it, it certainly caused some concern among those who have high hopes for this project. Uh, the quote from one developer was, 19 acres in the city, you would think, I would have thought the room would have been filled. Were you disappointed by how many, Jan, I'll start with you, you were there, were you disappointed by how many people showed up, or is it what you expected? I had no expectations. Um, I've been getting calls so that people do not, first of all, they did not have to show up. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you put on an RFP or an RFI and it's a requirement. And that's generally a requirement so you know the level of interest. In this case, we have said to people, you can respond directly on the toolkit or the RFI online. You can give me a call, send me an email. Um, so it wasn't a requirement. It's also open land. So you don't need to have access given to you by showing up and having me with a key in front of an abandoned building. You can drive it whenever you want. So if it's someone coming from New York or New Jersey, um, they can come when the weather's better, for example. <laughs> yeah. um, so it, it really was up to them to be able to schedule. It wasn't required. It did not require me to gain access. And uh, sometimes developers and investors don't want to tip their hand. They want to keep quiet what their proposal is, their level of interest. So that uh, the number that showed up, I, I had no expectations. It was also meant to be a chance for the public at large, Rhode Island public, to, to come and just hear the latest news, see the latest PowerPoint. What would you tell people, Colin, who saw that and said, oh no, no one wants the 195 land, it's, all gonna, it's not going to happen? You know, we, we went to market on February 4th, Ted, uh, and if I listed my house uh, in North Kingston on February 4th, I wouldn't have a lot of people looking at it either. Uh, it, uh, our, the world doesn't work at that pace. Uh, I think we have to be very encouraged over the last two or three years in the level of private investment in real estate in Providence. Uh, most of that investment uh, has been in residential and residential repurposing of existing buildings. But we've seen, you know, in buildings, you know, swipefully moving downtown. So we've seen increase in office uh, occupancy downtown as well. Uh, going vertical with new construction uh, is a, another kettle of fish. Uh, you know, first it's going to be the low-hanging fruit, those repurposing, and those are hard job projects, uh, but repurposing of existing uh, buildings where the math can work today. Uh, going vertical is a very expensive proposition um, and another level of commitment altogether. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to happen over time. Um, you know, uh, if we're going to build another third of a city, uh, downtown Providence took 300 years to get to where it is today. Uh, we're not going to take 300 years, uh, uh, but it's not going to happen in a day. Um, we hired Jones Lang LaSalle as our um, brokers to help promote and advertise the project. They have a very robust database and they have put the word out to large numbers of people, um, investors, uh, developers, uh, institutions, and their response has been, their feedback to us has been that they've been very encouraged by the level of activity and the level of response to the, um, the email chain that they sent out. All right, that's good to hear. And May 1st, beginning of May, Ted, uh, we would expect, this is our first round. Yeah. This is early college admissions. <laughs> uh, it's kind of that time of year. Um, the, so this, we basically you know, encourage everyone to get something in uh, just to kind of let us understand what the market's looking for. Uh, but that process is not going to stop. It's going to be a, ro a rolling admissions process where every 90 days 
uh, we'll be taking proposals and evaluating those packages. However, we encourage people to submit by May 1 because that's when all parcels are available and you get the best parcels by applying early. That's right. All right, that's, uh, we got to take a break. We're overdue for them. But as I said, so much to talk about this and we're going to talk much more at the other side of this break here in Executive Suite about the 195 land. Stick with us. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and we're talking today with the leaders of the I-195 Redevelopment District Commission, Jan Brody. She's the executive director, and Colin Kane, he's been chairman pretty much from the start of, the, of this, uh, this, this way of doing things for the 195 land. So I want to go right back to what we were talking about before the break, Jan, and um, can you give us a sense, viewers at home, a sense of the timeline and I know obviously it's mostly it's up to the developers in terms of a crane in the air or anything but when would the Commission begin to have say okay we have six proposals in front of us uh, let's discuss whether to vote on approving one of them when, when would that sort of actual action be happening so May 1st a proposal comes in and it will first be reviewed for completion make sure that um, ever all the requirements are in uh, the, the Commission meets once a month. It will meet more frequently if needed, if we get multiple proposals. The intent is that the Commission will not hold up a proposal. So it, it, we've said that it a good probably, proposal. A good proposal. One that meets um, the, the goals and ambitions and of the Commission as well as being from a credible um, a developer that, um, whose track record is one that we want to continue with. Um, so a proposal comes in and if it's a good proposal, 60-day turnaround and if it is one that perhaps is on a site that has multiple proposals then we might send it back and say all right we like your proposal we encourage you but what more can you do we got somebody else interested if that's the case it might be a 90-day turnaround in which case then the next round begins so that no proposal will have to sit um, waiting for us once we approve and we say all right level one you're good you get site control then you're not competing with anyone else for that parcel. Off you go. And the developer then goes and puts their architectural and engineering drawings together. Financing. Financing, uh, puts the whole package. And that can take a developer six months, eight, nine, uh, a right. year. Practically speaking, for a large building, 100, 150,000 square foot building, that could take 18 months. Okay. Yeah. Uh, not being driven by the commission. Um, right. That's just the We're practical the reality of design, engineering, and financing uh, for a large, complicated project. So although our schedule, uh, you pull, it's a pullout, shows up to 22 months, most of that is on the developer's side to try and put all the package materials together in order to make it to a closing, not on the approval side from the commission. Which is really cool, though, Deb, because uh, you know, that timeline um, uh, coincides very closely with the availability and completion of the utilities in the streets. Mm -hmm. uh, so today, People might, not, might forget that you have to build <laughs> sewers and electric yeah. lines and all that down yeah, there. It's under construction today. We apologize for the potholes. Um, <laughs> but you know, the, the, right now, even if someone had a fully approved plan and all their financing and construction drawings complete, there's nowhere to build because they have to plug into a, an electrical transformer or a sewer pipe. Uh, so the, the completion of you know, this design and engineering and permitting process coincides very, very closely with the availability of streets. It's almost as though um, they were at the outset put together because by the end of this uh, 2014, the west side parcels will be completed by DOT, all the infrastructure, the roads, the sidewalks, the trees. The west side will be completed um, summer of next year. And if we got a proposal in now, um, the summer of next year, we would we, it would be a stretch to try and build. So the timing is perfect. Parks and Bridge will follow in the beginning of 2016. Wait, on, you'll hate this question. That's okay. I know when, I when, when might people see a crane in the air, do you think? And I know, again, that depends on the developer, but... I think it goes to that timeline. It goes to, the, yeah. you know, um, so if we assume that we've got a good, credible developer, a good, credible project uh, that has viable economics, something that's consistent with what the city and the state would like to see in that location, something that generates jobs, um, and, and does the right thing for the land, uh, adds value to that property. Uh, I, I think we're looking at you know no earlier um, than fall of 2015, but more practically speaking, I think spring of 2016, yeah. uh, because that's when all of those component pieces come together. And most importantly, that's when a developer or a corporate user can finish their, their drawings and get their financing in place. And uh, what about, Jan, you hear some concern about the possibility of land banking, basically the idea that people would buy the land, because they're going to have to buy it, would buy the land from you and then maybe sit on it, you know, they, people see Capital Center isn't even done after many years or something like that, you know, is that a possibility that you'll sell it and then they'll say, well, maybe we won't do this project, but we have this land now. No, that's part of our statute. 
uh, within our statute, you have one year um, from the time that you close on the property to start construction, and then three years to complete. So that uh, it does preclude any sort of land banking. So you couldn't have someone buy this and hold it for 15 years no. and do nothing with it? Yeah, effectively and holding the state hostage for yeah. right. 15 years. I mean. it, even phasing. Um, you could probably do a proposal that phased within one of the development sites. Some of them are larger, so that perhaps not could co accommodate two buildings. You could possibly do a proposal that one building got built within a site um, and then followed by a second, but not multiple proposals and not multiple parcels. All right, we're going to take another break. When we come back, we're going to talk a bit about why the cost of building in Providence and, and doing these kind of uh, construction is so out of whack with uh, what the market can bear compared to, say, Boston. And you won't want to miss that because it's, it's important for a lot bigger issues than just the 195 land. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. We're talking to Colin Kane, the chairman of the I-195 Redevelopment District Commission, and Jan Brody, the commission's executive director, about their uh, push now to start to get development happening on that land. And Colin, uh, th something fascinating, and Jan, I'll just, Jan was summarized in the proger saying this, and this is a big part of why building in Providence is challenging these days. She said, uh, paraphrase, quote, there's a real disconnect between the cost to build, which is the same here as in New York or Boston, and the income one can generate with personal income and revenue generated by commercial property rents. Why is that? Why is it out of whack in Providence? You know, why are we paying Boston rates to do the projects, but we can't get Boston rates for, for what the projects are? Well, so I'll give just a little bit of uh, MBA 101, uh, Real Estate 101. Um, you know, there's the cost of, of creating the asset, uh, so land, soft cost, financing cost, bricks and sticks. Uh, so that's really the cost of creation. The cost uh, is, is labor and materials, and that's the same in Boston as it is in Providence. It's, it's the same in, quite frankly, in Kansas City. Uh, so that's not unique to Providence. Um, so we don't control that. That's an uncontrollable variable. Uh, where our challenges are from an economic perspective uh, in all secondary cities and tertiary cities around the country, not just Providence, uh, is that our rents are not high enough uh, to support uh, appropriate investor returns. Uh, very simple. If we, if my daughter rented an apartment in Boston, that apartment uh, would probably cost four thousand dollars a month. That same apartment in Providence would cost two thousand dollars a month. Um, so, th by that revenue top line, uh, it can only support so much debt service and so much equity return. It comes down to net income, and that's right. both the income side that Colin was just describing. And if it's on the commercial side, rents in Boston are sixty plus a square foot, and in Rhode Island and Providence, it's thirty, 30. or so. Um, but by net income, I mean it's not just that's the income side. Then there's the expense side. And the operating expenses include things like property taxes, which are at least 30, if not 40 percent higher here. Part of that is because it, it's a small city. It doesn't have the population to leverage it out, doesn't have the, the wide diversity in business base. So we need to grow both sides. We need to grow the population. We need to grow the commercial square footage to help leverage that tax rate and figure out how in the interim, how to, to, to bridge that gap. And Jan, a different interim question for you, <laughs> which a different use of the phrase, which is uh, what's the plan for these parcels, the ones that you want, not the parks, but the ones you want to develop eventually? As you said, it's going to be a while before, certainly before they're all filled. What happens to those parcels between the time right now where they're vacant, being <laughs> streets are being put down, and when there's a building on them? We've got an interim use program that we launched um, back in the November, December. And it, it was to promote the creative capital, uh, the creative energies of um, the residents of Providence and Rhode Island, and also to get people out amongst the parcels, get them out walking, make them aware of what we had. So what we're doing is putting up initially just six, and then it will follow with another, it by May, and it will follow by another six in the fall of um, smaller installations, not big iconic art, but installations that are creative ideas that both um, enhance the space, get people out, that uh, show people that it's a great city to live in, work in, and just move about. We are, it's, it's part of an, a wider campaign to get people to bring their car if they have to, to the city, but then leave it, get out and start walking. There are going to be bike trails, uh, something called City Walk. There are this bike share that's coming to the city. So there are bike lanes throughout the, the 195 district. And this is sort of the beginning of getting people out 
The city has a similar program, and I know the institutions have talked about doing their own. And then briefly, um, when do the actual parks that are going to be parks, when do you see them becoming full-fledged parks? We'll start to see some activity um, early next year, uh, starting with the bridge, and then the parks will also start to be edged so that you can visualize what they're going to look like. Um, they won't be completed until the end of 2015 and the beginning of 2016. Ultimate Frisbee Championship, uh, Westside Park, Spring of 2016. <laughs> uh, you know, I think people, if, if there are viewers out there, uh, they might see this and say, well, why are these folks wasting time talking about soft stuff? Uh, you know, they're talking about art, they're talking about parks. Uh, the truth is that this is a retail product. Uh, and we have some extraordinary assets to highlight. We have a, we're on the bay, uh, we have this great city, this great walking city. Uh, and, and being able to you know, highlight these, these attributes uh, through visual components is important. And we can do a couple, we can do many things at once. Okay. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Carmen, uh, I have to ask you, Prozo Editorial, uh, or op-ed, just got people chattering. Prozo was a 195 land, should be used to build a new baseball stadium for the Paw Sox, replacing uh, beloved McCoy Stadium. Is that feasible? Well, I don't know about the math of a stadium. I love, I love the Pawtucket Red Sox, and I love going to McCoy Stadium. Uh, it was an interesting article. Uh, you know, certainly if someone was interested in proposing a, a stadium, they should go through our transparent and open process. Uh, so, uh, you know, but ideas are welcome, uh, but ideas just being kind of thrown out there uh, in, the, uh, in the cloud as opposed to go through the process, there's a decision-making process, an economic evaluation that has to be undertaken. One of the criteria is financial feasibility. Financial feasibility. Mm -hmm. So you can't just say, I, I mean, I like just baseball have a stadiums. Great, great ideas are great ideas, but they need a little substance behind them. you got to go do it. One other um, idea, Gina Raimondo uh, in her thing, and I want to ask you a comment directly because I, I, we talked off air, you said uh, you weren't too familiar with it, but she mentioned this week the potential of giving away parts of land or selling it at very low cost for a project she's proposing. And one thing people might not realize, there is a cost to the, there's a cost your commission has. You have to pay the bonds that you use to buy this land. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. The value of the land was always contemplated uh, back when the original highway project was was funded through the feds. Uh, the value of the property was part of the state's contribution uh, to the cost of completion. So yes, we have forty-two million dollars of bonds that will be repaid uh, with the sale of each parcel. Uh, the commission has discretion. We have to sell it at fair market value, but we do have discretion over sort of, you know, fair market value is also driven by the end use. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have some discretion. Uh, we're, we're excited that any gubernatorial candidate or mayoral candidate is talking about the link. Uh, we very much look forward to working with whoever leadership is uh, uh, as our partners, because uh, it's going to take a whole bunch of folks uh, to make this work. And very briefly, we're just about out of time. When do the bonds have to be repaid back? That's a 20-year bond. 20-year bond. Yes, okay. Sir. All right. That's all the time we have. We could have done a lot more with Colin Kane and Jan Brody, but I want to have you both back. I hope to talk more about this, and thank you for being here. If you missed any of this show or any other episode of Executive Suite, you can catch all those on our website, WPRI.com. Be sure to tune in next week when my guest will be Dr. Barrett Brady. He's CEO of NABSIS, a high-tech company in Providence. And we'll see you next week here on Executive Suite.